my name is Brad Grady. I'm the principal analyst, or a principal analyst at Northern Sky Research, focused on the satellite communications market, mobility, government and military applications. And today we're talking about a very cool topic of leveraging satellite mobility sweet spot in the terminal segment. Uh, today's session is brought to you by the great folks at GVF. Sorry, I got to get the right side. Um, Emission Microwave. So the, the folks that are known for the round bucks, they do some really awesome stuff. Steve and his and the team over there. Um, if you have a chance, check out their website. Um, they're kind of one of the key people that are enabling a lot of the cool things that we're going to be talking about today. So with me, uh, I have some really great panelists today. Um, we're going to be talking all the way across the, the technology value chain from service providers, Speedcast at Will, to Astronics Matt, uh, Italian Vlad, and GetSat Jason. Uh, so I'll ask them to introduce themselves in a few seconds here. But it's really a very interesting and innovative time to be talking about these topics. I'm really excited. Please ask questions throughout the entire webinar. Um, we have some questions that, that we'll be asking and some really great discussion points, but we really do want you to be involved. So kind of use the features down below to ask your questions and we'll kind of get those on screen. So, Will, why don't we start with you? Can you please give us a, a short little intro of you and Speedcast and what you're up to? Yeah, hey, good morning, everybody, or good day to you all. Thank you. My name is Will Mudge. I am the Vice President of Engineering Operations at Speedcast. Uh, I manage our day-to-day our, our -day engineers and our, our strategies for some of our key technologies. Speedcast is a global uh, solutions provider for our customers. We do everything from uh, designing solutions, satellite capacity. We take all of the components that all these great companies here make and uh, make them work for our customers. So, uh, interesting to be part of the panel. Really glad to be part of it. And uh, thanks, Brad, for setting it up in, in Mission Microwave, of course. Vlad, can you tell us what's up at Antillion? Sure. My name is Vladimir Stavropoulos, but I'm being called by Vlad because it's too long. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm with Intellion. Uh, as everybody knows, we manufacture terminals and we enable service providers and customers around the world to be leading the, le the edge of technology as they are evolving their satellite needs. Uh, in Intellion, we work closely with most of everybody on this call, especially Speedcast is a very good partner of us and very glad and happy to have this round table and conversations today. Jason, can you tell us about GetSat and what you're up to? Hey, hey, Brad. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, Jason Stevens, Vice President, Gets at North America, responsible for the daily operations, uh, business development in the North American market for Gets at. So Gets at is a privately owned company. Uh, we specialize in micronization of satellite communication terminals from the mechanical based terminals with passive panels on them to uh, active ele electronically steerable arrays. Um, we've been growing exponentially over the last three to four years and look forward to uh, having deep discussions today. Matt, tell us what's up at Astronics. Good morning. Thanks for the opportunity to be in this discussion panel and welcome to all of you who are joining online. Uh, my name is Matt Landel and I'm the Director of Sales Engineering at Astronics Aerosat. At Aerosat, we focus on SATCOM connectivity for aircraft. We've been designing, developing, and deploying SATCOM terminals on BizJet, commercial airliners, and special mission aircraft for over 15 years. Uh, initially, we uh, were in the BizJet market uh, deploying terminal for a connection by Boeing. We were provided some of the very first domestic SATCOM installations on commercial airliners. Uh, we have hundreds of terminals in service in the BizJet market. We're providing uh, the terminal to Collins Aerospace Lux Stream Service, which is in very high demand. Uh, in the commercial airliner market, we continue to do installations for Aeroflot and others. Um, uh, Aerosat has recently joined with uh, Connectivity Systems and Certification, the business unit of um, Astronics, and that extends our expertise to include the end-to-end -end integration capabilities. So that puts us as a market leader for cabin wireless access points. Uh, we generate, uh, uh, produce ModMan and KPSUs for a variety of integrators. We make adapter plates. We do installation designs. We do certification. We have access to uh, aircraft. And uh, looking into the future, we're applying that expertise to design and build a prototype of what we call the universal ESA chassis or terminal. And that is applying the lessons learned over all this time to solve all the operational pain points of existing connectivity systems, including thermal for fully active ESAs. And so we're looking that as a best path to integrate ESA panel technologies to aircraft. And we're looking forward to today's discussion. Great, thanks. So. I want to break the conversation into kind of three main themes. 
One is focused on new markets, new opportunities, kind of the evolving role in, this, in the value chain. Um, a lot of those lines are being blurred about what's an antenna versus a terminal manufacturer, what role do modems have, what, what role do service providers, satellite operators have to play. So those will be some great discussion points. The other one is focusing on the technology itself um, and trying to get down to what those trade-offs are and how everyone is approaching optimizing the solutions for the best customer needs. And then the last one is just a, a general kind of open conversation about game changers. And I know that's a really overused, well-baked term in, in this industry these days, um, but it's really talking about Leo, flat panel antennas, software defined, and kind of the, the softwareification of everything. So you know, continue to ask your questions um, as they come up. But Will, I, I want to start with you. Um, can you maybe talk to us about how the past kind of 12 months have been? Um, lots of things have gone on. I mean, not specifically with, with Speedcast, obviously, but just, you know, COVID-19 has really changed or, or paused a lot of how the mobility markets are, have looked and how have you responded to that and kind of what do you think is going on? Yeah, it's been a crazy 12 months, I think, for everyone. I, uh, I joked with a colleague yesterday that, you know, COVID was supposed to slow everything down and, and, and change our business a bit. And it did, you know, Speedcast went through a really challenging time over the last 12 months, but so did many of our customers. It was really interesting to see, you know, we have not slowed down in the least. I think we're seeing increased demand for communications, not just in satellite, but globally. COVID has driven people to start to work from home, you know, and increase reliability or increase the need for communications. And I think it's really pushed a lot of, us uh, in this in this form in this in this market to be able to provide more solutions to them you know as cruise customers had to get passengers off at the beginning of the pandemic or get crew and, and uh, home right we deal with a lot of last minute planning to accommodate these things and if there's one thing that we found over the last 12 months the key to the, all of this is flexibility our customers are looking for flexibility we're looking for flexibility we're looking for that communications experience that everyone likes and i think you're seeing that with a lot of the products that are coming to market that these that these companies are bringing, and it really helps uh, at the end of the day to provide that to to our end user base. Now, Jason, you you focus on a, I mean, Speedcast obviously focused on commercial and government, um, but when we have conversations in NSR, government seems to be one of the markets that's been growing like crazy. Um, so I want to kind of bring your perspective in, both on technology provider side and and government side focus of. How do you see the past 12 months? How's, how's business been for you? Well, we, we've seen a, an exponential growth in business over the last 12 to 18 months. Uh, COVID, COVID, did play a, <clears throat> excuse me, COVID did play a role in being able to get face-to-face -face with customers and just being more fluid and, and as Will said, uh, more uh, able to, uh, uh, to, to stretch out and, and touch different markets. But um, what we have seen over the last 12 to 18 months is, is, the, is the, the push for the mobility uh, capability uh, with our government customers. So the government customers uh, that we work with are, are really, you know, they, they've got that, that uh, base and, uh, you know, primary location C4 figured out. It's the, it's the ability to push that data, exfil that data from the forward line of troops back for processing and, and, and further movement. So what we've seen in the last 12 to 18 months has been a real shift uh, from the standard use of data and information flow uh, from the government customer and the, the requirement to move that data off of the field uh, back to an assessment and then back to the forward to continue processing uh, potential winnings. Mm -hmm. uh, we've now, seen a huge change in that. Now, how is your technology kind of changing that paradigm? Do you think you're opening up new markets, new use cases, new opportunities? Well, I, I think we are. Um, what, what we have seen is, is there's no longer, there's no longer that uh, low data rate requirement um, or that, you know, that uh, requirement for just a, a lot of site communication. Um, when you, when you, when you have a team that's operating forward and they're, they're afraid, they're, they're unafraid and alone out at the, the forward edge, um, the ability to have communication back and, and, and to coordinate has, has, it is, that requirement has, has really, really changed. Um, and uh, with, with the small form factor terminals, whether it be a GetSat terminal or, or any other terminal that is able to do a high data rate and, and, and exfil data and, and forward data to, to, the, to the flight, what we call the forward line of troops, um, it has really changed the way 
um, militaries are processing information. Uh, it, it just increases the requirement for the information flow. Um, and it has allowed much, much more uh, information to go back and forth to commanders, uh, intelligence assessments and things like that. So it's, it's, we've, seen it, uh, we've seen a huge change in the last 12 to 18 months uh, in those requirements. And it, 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 with, with small form factor terminals like GetSat Mates and, and other uh, terminals, um, they're starting to populate more and more out in the battlefield, which uh, is going to have a requirement for more spectrum, more bandwidth, more service providers. Um, and, and in our opinion, uh, from a GetSat standpoint, it's it's we see exponential growth over the next you know three to five years for that specific requirement, additional requirements. Mm -hmm. Now, Vlad, I want to bring you in because um, you're focused maybe a little bit more on the commercial side. And I think Will and, and Jason mentioned two key points. Um, Will mentioned flexibility. Uh, Jason mentioned exponential data increases. And I think that's a story and a trend that we can see, you know, find or place whatever vertical market you want to talk about. Um, so I'm wondering how you're approaching this kind of flexibility and data requirements and all those things. So for us has been into the ability to create terminals that reduce the footprint, but they're able to deliver larger capacity to it. And we have invested and put a lot of effort into optimize the RF to the point that the environment is able to utilize a smaller size terminal while delivering the high end throughput the customers that Will is mentioning and Jason is seeing are requiring. We do see a significant growth in, because of COVID environment, the leisure market growth again, because you have to isolate yourself, nothing better than isolating your own yacht or in your own boat and go into an island where nobody will be around you. But you still wanna be connected because those persons will still need to work as remote as we all have been moved to work out. And that's where we have added value to. We have released in the last 12 to 18 months about six different size terminals with edge technology, diversified for vendors and providers around the world in multiple band. We are continuing to implement our multi-band antennas across the board where all of the markets are getting adapted to the new requirement where high demand ability to switch between orbitals. Uh, can I go to Mio while I'm in the Caribbean? And if I have to go to the cone, can I switch to G or can I go to an L band? So all of those are being a key demanders and a key players for us to deliver the services the customer are expecting. Mm -hmm. Now you, see, mentioned, you mentioned one word, um, edge. Yeah. And you know I kind of set off some light bulbs in my brain. Um, okay. What does that mean for you as an antenna company? Like, what, so, edge what? For us, it means being able to optimize and improve delivery of something that has been with us for 40, 40, 40 to 50 years. Mm -hmm. So all of our antennas, the third parabolic systems has been on the market forever. What we have done is find the ways to push the technology boundary, new materials, new components, reduce loss, increase performance, re new materials on domes, where the way that you were delivering before six to seven max, you can achieve 20 or 15 with the same setup without having to compromise in extra weight or magnificent changes to the structure of the vessel. That's what we have put ourselves into the edge of the push. Okay, cool. So like the, the edge of the network, right? Not like edge, edge of compute the, or something. Yeah, okay. yeah. cool. Um, Matt, you, you mentioned uh, some really cool things in your intro. Um, and I think a kind of a soup to nuts approach of, all the things that maybe a lot of people don't appreciate of integrating things to an airframe and all these, you know, other, other stuff that has to happen. Um, how are you seeing all of these kinds of innovations enabling new markets? Um, Rotorcraft, I think is one that we talk about a lot. Small UAVs is another one that we talk about. Um, but how do you see that evolving? I think um, some of the things that we've seen in, in the last few years are, are really for us leveraging sort of a, a very detailed uh, investigation of the of an antenna and all of the parts that go into an antenna. So in, increasing efficiencies, uh, increasing um, um, the performance that you get. Right on an aircraft, you've got a very limited volume, and you have to have a very high performing antenna to go in that. So that's one of the reasons that we bring our, our lens horn technology, where we have the highest aperture efficiency, so we get the best performance. So you know, as others were talking, to be able to bring you know uh, in home performance. 
uh, to an aircraft where you're remote uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, that's kind of where we've been focused. Um, and again, it, it comes down to leveraging the technologies that are available and that are continually being developed to get that high performance into the aircraft. You know, we want our, our customers to be able to, uh, you know, Zoom calls like we're doing right now, uh, be able to have multiple people on an aircraft doing Zoom calls while other passengers are streaming uh, high def video and we're demonstrating and doing that with, uh, with our customers now. Especially as uh, with COVID happening over the past year, a lot of things have been pushed off of the commercial airliner and there's a, it's pushed a lot of people into flying uh, private aircraft. So um, looking to uh, really, really develop in that market, which we've been doing quite, very well. And then again, carrying enough uh, new technologies to support uh, what people are really looking for in, in aircraft where, and, and, and it is a market where um, certification is a big issue. It takes a lot, a lot of time and money to, to develop something and put it on an aircraft and approve it for use. So um, even things that, you know, we can have working in the lab today, it may take anywhere from six months plus to, to a year to uh, actually put it on an aircraft and certify it for public use. Yeah, no, and I think that's a, that's a good dynamic to, to dig a little deeper into is the technology timelines versus certification timelines. Um, when you're looking to open up a new market, can you kind of walk us through how you approach those things? Are these parallel processes or serial processes where kind of the technology has to reach a certain stage before you can really do the, the certification process? And you mentioned this kind of common, you know, integration capability or, you know, universal ESA or something in your opening statement. How does that fit into that, that dynamic? So when we look at uh, technology development, the technologies clearly have to be reasonably advanced to be able to uh, invest to put in, into it. Uh, put it onto an aircraft. Uh, but our, uh, so there's parallel development of technology uh, and then there's development of the customers and the customer base and, and the relationships with the service providers as well. You've got you know, the customers, whether at an airline or a bizjet, um, you've got the service providers, you've got the uh, aircraft manufacturers, right? And you have the satellite and network operators. Um, and then there's us doing the antenna and the terminal. And there are many dynamics going on in that in that whole arena. So we're looking to take whatever the most advantageous technology is today, uh, and monitoring what's going on in technology developments for the future, right? So that we can carry the latest and best technology available into each certification effort. And that's kind of where that that universal ESA comes into, where we've looked at all of, if you will, the worst case of what active ESAs might put onto an aircraft in terms of thermal and power and all of that. We said, okay, well, all of these things have to be addressed and all of the things have to be solved to be able to put ESAs on aircraft. And so we set about solving that and demonstrating that through a variety of different kind of panels. And so we continue to monitor and work with a number of different panel vendors to be able to say, okay, we can take that technology, we can put it on an aircraft. And we have a, a prototype in the lab now that that can do that kind of thing, uh, but it becomes the relationship building uh, with the airlines, which have clearly you know, been impacted by COVID, uh, but also BizJet and uh, ISPs to be able to take these technologies and then um, integrate it into a system and have a, have a customer sitting at the, at the end who wants to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And well, I think this gets back to kind of your opening statement about flexibility, and that might end up being what the theme of this webinar is really. Um, but there's some things that just aren't flexible. Um, and one is ultimate performance and then balance that against cost and balance that against needs. And this kind of, how do you deal with this price versus capabilities versus service and, and matching that to the right customer and kind of walking them through this story of, you know, what's important versus what's just sounds cool. Um, and kind of, how do you, how do you approach that when you talk to customers? Yeah, that's an actually a really interesting question. I think it ties into the question that was submitted here too. You know, what's the best system for me, right? We get this all the time. And uh, same as Matt was saying, a lot of it has to come down to education of what you can do, right? What's the state of the art today? What's the technology readiness levels for these things? How much bandwidth can we put through them? You know, I think we're seeing two different growth paths that, that are kind of going in parallel. One is we're seeing a progression of the state of the art, right? Better antennas, better amplifiers, more signal gain out of it, better software to track them. And then we're seeing a growth also in user demand and bandwidth. So you're trying to put more through a system that uh, has to be designed to increase its capacity for those, those flexible options. So then you got to get down to 
okay, now you've got this great terminal, this great solution, which one's the best? Why do I pick, you know, optical or phased array or parabolic, you know, why, what's the trade-offs with them? And a lot of it depends on the constellation that you're trying to connect to, whether you're trying to go uh, a geo satellite or a MEO or a LEO or be flexible for all of them, there are trade-offs between them. And that's where I think education really comes into play, doing forums like this, understanding what those options are. What is LEO, right? What are the LEO options going to be for me? How does that compare to MEO? Do I need that? Mm-hmm. Right. When I look at an optical terminal, am I able to deal with losses from clouds or rain issues? Can I deal with that outage or do I need something like C-band for an always on type of connectivity? Mm-hmm. So it really all comes together and it comes down to what that customer needs. Right. That's where that flexibility statement comes in. Every customer is different. Right. They all want something different. Some want a ridiculous amount of bandwidth. Some want a huge amount of availability. Some want the lowest cost solution they can get on there and remain connected. And each one's a different answer. Yeah. Um, and just to bring everyone else in on the conversation, I'll throw the question up that, that Will was talking about. And the question is, what antenna technology is the future of SATCOM? Optical systems, phased array, metastructures, what will be most important? Price, efficiency, size, weight, regulation, sign blow, cross pole, discrimination? Um, Vlad, maybe we'll start with you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we do see a diversity of points that you mentioned, and that is the paradigm of the challenges that we present that we have to face day in and day out. As Will was saying, the solution to a customer is custom built. And in the cruise line, there is always a joke, says a ship, it's always a standard of himself because the vessel that sits in Australia has different needs as a ship that sits in the Caribbean. And of course, the adaptability that a terminal or a system now, because Unfortunately, or fortunately, I will say, one of the main key points is your system needs to be able to adapt to all of that flexibility that Will was mentioned as a service provider, he needs to accommodate for his customers. For us, is how do we enable that with the less amount of frictions to the end customer? As we train them so they understand what they're buying, but also their investment is protected in the long term. We put a lot of time and it ties up to what you were talking early, software define everything. How do we bring that simplicity that we obtained it 12, 13 years ago when Steve Jobs pulled up his iPhone on his hand and everybody's jaw dropped. And since then the technology for cell phones has changed. How do we bring that simplicity to a very challenging and complex environment, which is satellite networks. And we constantly evolve around that while we create the flexible environment where a customer can switch from his MIO to his GEO and be ready for when LEO becomes available. So there is not a simple solution to outline what is the best terminal. Mm -hmm. I will say, how do we serve you best and let the team train you, educate you. So when we present the option, the value proposition is not just tied up to a dollar amount. Mm -hmm. It's how do you start today to grow where you want to be. It, and, you know, I think there's an end user education coming of this for sure. Um, but I'm curious about your thoughts of the engagement. Is it your job as an antenna and terminal manufacturer to educate customers? So, or is it Speedcast? Or is it the satellite operator? Some combination of all the so above? let me tell you, I, I'm going to share the secret sauce between Will and myself. We <laughs> have no, uh, normally the, the clients will be approached by a service provider uh, because they're the one delivering the bandwidth. We deliver a piece of component of the entire value chain. So the customer may say, I heard that somebody has a terminal called X. In our case, let's say they wanna beat to 40 MT on their ship. And then will uh, people from his team come approach us and say, hey, can we have a webinar with this customer? And we share the environment where we train the customer on the value proposition that we as partners are able to bring to them. And how do you leverage size? How do you leverage environment? How you level a multi-band, multi-orbit? And how do you leverage the composition of your investment today to grow in time? And critically to this, sometimes goes the way around. We get approached by the same customer, let's say, and say, hey, my friend told me that he has this, I want the same. 
we can talk about the antenna and immediately we say, hey, we're gonna need Will to sit with us to tell you how that system can deliver the value that you're expecting outside of just the hardware. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it, it's surprisingly common how much, I mean, how small the industry really is, but a lot of these end users are talking to each other or have worked for each other and they're like, oh yeah, no, I did this and it was great and I had that and it was perfect. Um, so it, it's always interesting when you kind of hear those those conversations. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you want to get uh, Yeah, maybe if I could just chime in on this one yeah. too. You know, we're a pretty intimidating industry, I think, in general, right? It's not like Vlad said with the iPhone, we're not as cool as the iPhone yet where you can just buy an iPhone and you get a great service out of it, right? There's a lot of technology that goes into it and there's a lot of different things that go around with it. What I find is how you customers tend to approach us they don't really know, right? There's not really a great path to come in. So they'll go in and any path they could find, hey, I know this guy who knew this guy who thinks he knows this guy and they find a way in through it, right? So, you know, I really put the onus back on all of us, right? As an industry that as people come in and they have them, try to help them out, right? Try to get them an answer because it, it, it is kind of a hard thing to penetrate if you're coming into it unknown. Like you said, it's a small industry. We all tend to know everybody and that is great, right? It's, it's great because we're all this one big happy family but getting in, it, it can be a challenge. So, you know, like Vlad said, whenever you see somebody come in and they have a question, help them out, right? Mm -hmm. Try to point them in the right direction. We can always answer things for people. Mm -hmm. and, and Matt, I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts here of kind of playing the dynamics of who is the customer? Is the customer like the airframe manufacturer or the airline or the service provider or, uh, you know, some other thing? How do you see your, your role evolving in this kind of, you know, chain of becoming a component manufacturer to a terminal provider now to a maybe solution provider or kind of an educational role. How do you see that dynamic? Well, I think from a customer standpoint, they're all our customer. And as Will was trying to say, I mean, it, you really, the goal is to make your customer happy and give them the solution that gives them what they need for their particular application. I think there's a lot of interesting thing going on in the industry, particularly in the, on the airborne side, I guess, because you've got, um, right, today, to a large extent, the contracts are between uh, a service provider and an airline, right? And there are various uh, service level agreements that are set up and so on and so forth. You've got uh, Airbus and to some extent Boeing and even the, the Seamless Air Alliance uh, moving forward and trying to create more of an agnostic uh, level of hardware where they, because of the cost of, of building the aircraft and integrating hardware, they're looking at saying, um, I want to be able to just buy a piece of hardware and put it on the aircraft and it'll work with any service provider or at least some subset or very num uh, limited number of service providers. So this, the dynamic is a little bit changing, I think, uh, and, and will continue to be, be a little fluid in the next several years as, um, you know, you have some people who are looking to buy equipment independent of the service providers. You have airlines who are trying to figure out who do I go to to ask for this? Do I go to the airframe or do I go to the, the uh, service providers? And the service providers who of course are looking to say, well, if I, if I have this set of equipment, it's what I'm familiar with, it's what I know, and I know that it works, that means I can meet the contractual agreements that I'm making. So uh, for us as a, as a provider of equipment, um, we're really, the requirement is to play uh, in all of those arenas. And, and uh, as uh, Bled and, and Will were saying, it's a teaming arrangement, right? You have to be willing to partner, and, and it's a small enough uh, uh, um, industry, as people were talking about, that we have to be willing to partner and look to partner with our with uh, either the airframers or the service providers or uh, an integrator, or potentially we can be the integrator. So again, uh, I think one of the things that, that Astronics and Aerosat has brought to the, been bringing to the table throughout our history is we're agnostic and we're willing to work at whatever level the customer is really looking for. Today's roundtable event is sponsored by Mission Microwave. The company provides X, KU and KA band solid state amplifiers and block up converters for leading SATCOM terminal and gateway manufacturers. Mission's product line covers 12 to 400 watt high power solutions and includes products for LEO, MEO, and GEO satellite ground stations. Jason, I want to you know, bring so. you in on the conversation here. And I think a lot of people maybe have this you know, idea that government and military markets are like this monolithic, everyone has the same needs, they're one end user, one customer, and that's really not 
right? I mean, it's a super fragmented, almost an N equals one kind of use case market. So how are you approaching this technology trade space? How are you seeing these conversations developing and, and what are you doing in this area? Well, I, I, will, I will say that uh, you can go from one army unit to another army unit uh, five miles from each other and they'll all have different requirements, right? So um, the, the ability for uh, the requirements generation to uh, rise to leadership has really, has, has really increased over the last uh, you know, five or six years. Let's, let's take the, the, the UAV uh, market. Uh, just just as, a, as an example. So for the class two, class three UAV market, you have 10, 15 different platforms out there, right? And each platform has a different payload requirement. Each platform has different um, um, sensor capabilities on board. That means each platform has a different data rate requirement to exfiltrate or, do, or push forward to, to the UAV. And each individual unit in the United States military could potentially be operating different UAVs, um, whether, it, whether it be a class two or a class three, whether they need line of sight or whether they need beyond line of sight. So um, it goes back to the, the previous three comments from both Will, Vlad, and from Matt. Um, every installation is custom. Uh, it, 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 that's the way it feels to get set, right? So, so we, we move, um, we, we have, uh, come to the realization that, you know, every platform is going to be a custom installation. Um, every platform is going to have different requirements. Um, you may have a requirement for a platform that, you know, they can only provide eight pounds of payload capacity for a beyond line of sight solution. And they have a six megabit per second exfiltration uh, requirement. Uh, you may have another platform that only want to, wants to give you four pounds. They may want 10 megabits off of the aircraft. So, I, I use those examples to say that, you know, every, every problem set is a custom problem set and it, it does require everyone to work together from the service prior, provider to the integrator, to the end user, to the manufacturer of the airframe and, and uh, the operator that is going to operate it forward. Uh, it, is a, it is a custom solution in our experience, what we've seen over the last two years in, in nearly every situation. And everyone's requirements are completely different. So, Justin, I want to stay with you, but uh, I also, this is a great segue to our next topic, our next kind of theme, uh, which is the technology. Um, and what is this trade space and how do you kind of work against technical milestones and these, you know, plethora of end user requirements that change? So, please ask you know, please continue to ask your questions on the bottom. We'll try to get them. If we don't answer them live, we'll, we'll post some answers when the video gets posted. But Jason, I'm, I'm just curious, how do you kind of not have uh, N equals one technology roadmap as well, right? How do you balance that customer requirements, customer needs versus eventually you have to reach sort of, sort of economies of scale and rationalize this stuff? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a parallel path uh, of development and operational use cases and where you see the market going. Um, and ultimately, you know, um, it is a business and we have to figure out a business case on, on the best path forward, right? So um, it, it's, it's difficult uh, to say the least um, with uh, the increase in, in capabilities and technology over the last three or four years. And, you know, we'll see it over the next uh, three or four more years with, with uh, Leo Constellations fully populated. Um, it's, it's, it's a distinct challenge. You know, how, how do you, you're continually evolving as a terminal developer uh, to maintain uh, your place in the market to ensure that when say a Starlink or a OneWeb or a Telesat are fully operational, how do you interface with that? And it's, it is a, it's a difficult proposition for a company to maintain you know, uh, how, how do you maintain that current business model and also prepare for three or four years down the road, not knowing 100% um, where that technology is going to ultimately end up. So uh, you have to hedge your bets uh, from a business standpoint and from a technology standpoint um, and be confident and, and uh, provide the, the users a current requirement that meets their minimum threshold or objective requirement. Um, but it is a, it's a, it's a difficult proposition um, and it's tough to navigate. Mm -hmm. um, now, yeah. Well. Brad, I would like to supplement something from Jason yeah. is as we're sure about the same line of business. Mm -hmm. uh, we do see a massive increase into things like how this terminal that I'm buying today will be compatible with Starlink or Telesatellite Speed or OneWeb 
in three years when they are fully capable. And one of the things that I see that has been a common theme amongst everybody talking here is that we have to continue to work together. There is no way to hedge forward without collaboration from each other. And the closest the who is to the customer is the one feeding the needs to everybody on the side tracks and understand that the demands that Jason is serving is not the demands that I'm serving. He's serving aircraft, on manned aircraft, or, or uh, Matt is providing helicopters with systems that are, we will never see them try to overcome right off the bat. It will be quite difficult uh, curve to learn and all the nice uh, technology that they're trying to implement. But whoever that it is in, the sharing of information, the collaboration amongst ourselves, to be able to get there is what it will serve best the customers of you. Yeah, yeah go ahead, Matt. I, th I think one of the things there is also, you know, uh, Jason was saying, you know, every customer is unique, and, and that's very, very true in, in, in that market. But there's also trying to bring together a level of technology that covers a sufficiently large market, right, to make that business case close. Mm -hmm. So that you can say, well, I've got a terminal, right, and, and if you look at, uh, at uh, airlines, right, they're looking, they're very conservative. I have geo now and geo HTS. I want that, right? But I want it to be future-proofed for Leo and, and things. How do I, how do I accomplish that? So um, creating something that you know uh, can fit. You know, I think one of the, the advantages of ESAs coming down the road and, and those kinds of technologies, the scalability of those that I can take these, make them smaller for some platforms, larger for other platforms, but at least get it down to a manageable number of products that can fit a, a wide enough range of, of, of platforms for me, aircraft platforms, right? So you've got the large cabin commercial, I've got the RJs and the biz jets that are relatively similar. And then I have my uh, smaller, smaller aircraft as well. So a minimum of, of two to three products there that need to cover a large enough base um, and provide the performance that's required uh, to, to satisfy the customer needs. Mm -hmm. Now, well, you maybe have some more flexibility in making these choices um, since, you know, you have the option of just kind of buying stuff. Um, but how do you go about kind of rationalizing these end user wants with kind of closing the business case and, and those sorts of things? I mean, there's lots of pressure in government markets of, you know, keeping maybe keeping price or, or whatever, even more pressures on the commercial side. And everyone wants ultimate flexibility, but that comes with the ultimate price. Um, so how do you have those conversations? Yeah, I mean, it you know, looking at like swap size, weight and power and cost, you know, to try to fit to it. We try to lay out the options for them, right? Cause it goes back to that, that education thing. If you can lay out what's available in the market today from here's your hardware, here's your, your, your bandwidth costs, or here's a Leo and these what those options can be and then help them choose what they think is best for their business. Maybe they choose a lower size, a lower swap product, uh, you know, has a high capability, but a high cost that goes with it. But you know what, they may be willing to do that to help future proof them out a bit. Mm -hmm. or maybe they don't have the budget to be able to support that bespoke solution off the get go. So they say, you know what, we're just gonna go with this other one, which goes back to kind of like uh, what Jason was saying. I think there is a lot of disparity between the customers and what they want and what they need. And while I agree, it's hard to see the vision of five years of exactly what this is and how we plan it out, there still is you know, the fundamental development of the technology that's really driving a lot of the industry as it is, right? You see ESA's developed, they've developed a lot more in the last 18 months than they have in a long time. Uh, I would be remiss without mentioning Mission Microwave and saying, you know, when you look at amplifier development and how that progresses, an amplifier is an amplifier, we're going to need it, right? We need to continue to progress that technology because it's an enabler for what we do. At the end of the day, it's a solution you can provide to a customer for it. So I think there is a degree of just continuing to push you know, the state of the art uh, forward because it's, it's what we all build on. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of what you're asking, right? How do you, how do you continue to build on what we see? And how yeah, no, and all those, you know, all those components that go into the network, right? I mean, you know, Mission Microwave is probably a good example of, of what one of the components that goes in that maybe end users have no idea what they are, right? They just kind of look and they go, oh. um, <laughs> but, you know, I think everyone is really kind of getting very savvy about this stuff. Um, and I want to kind of open one question, um, and I'll raise my hand first. I'm not an engineer, so this is maybe a little little risk. But specifications, um, we all talk about specifications and you know air interface standards and 5G and harmonization and all that other kinds of stuff. Why should end users care 
about standards and specifications. A lot of it is how it affects them, I think. Sorry, Vlad. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. You can start. <laughs> go ahead, Will. You started. I, I think the specs, uh, it's an engineer speak for what it means to them, right? What does a mission microwave mean to them? Like you said earlier, they, they may not know that that's the component in there that's driving them, but when they ask for, you know, I need a 200 megabit return and you say, well, there's only so many pieces in the world that can make that happen. You know, here's what they are. That's where those specs develop out of it. I think it comes from a base user requirement of what they need. So, mm -hmm. Sorry, Vlad, didn't mean to step over you there. No, no, Vlad. absolutely not. I actually step over you, so no worries. <laughs> so we see the specs as a, as, a, as a push to development and as a push to grow. Um, in Talion, we normally uh, elev elevate our, our technology by new specs. Uh, customers will come and say, I want a 200 megabit return link. And that involved changing from one wave guide to another one or creating a new one, study the way to eliminate losses in order to deliver those uh, 200 megabits on a, on a customer side. But in the opposite side, what it's a regulatory specifications is the one that keeps us all of us honest in to make sure that we are able to operate among ourselves and not create the massive problems that not a long time ago, Jason, some of the other, um, sorry, Jason or Brad, some of the other cases that we were talking with the team from the satellite show, it is spacecraft collision. So all of that are specifications that they're coming around for a user terminal are part of it to make sure we don't interfere with the other user terminal as we're able to deliver the 200 megabits that customer is looking for. So it is a push to make the technology better and more efficient and make us grow as we go by. Mm -hmm. Jason, if there's, I mean, maybe Matt deals with, with more kind of specifications than you do, but if, if there's somebody that has to deal with this kind of plethora of air interface standards and RStrat and all those other kinds of government specs, um, how do you see and approach those kinds of questions about specifications and, you know, COTS versus mil spec and, and that world? Right. Well, well, from, from a get that standpoint, you know, we, we operate typically, you know, we're a, probably an 80, 20 government com to commercial uh, customer base. So from a, from a, from a government specification um, requirement, we're going to see the mill standard A10G. We're going to be required to have a 461 requirement for any maritime roll on roll off or maritime installation. Um, you know, we're talking, you know, Matt, <clears throat> Matt discusses, you know, uh, wide body aircraft and, and things like that. You know, there's, you know, a rank 791 and 792 for ESAs is, is very, very important. And, you know, so we, we tackle each one depending on what the uh, in customer requirements are, um, whether it be you know, 810, 461, or DO 160, or 791 and 792. Um, those, are, those are things that we tackle uh, very, uh, every one of our terminals we've had to go through uh, one of those government certification uh, requirements. Um, and as we move forward and continue to develop uh, technology, uh, we, we have a lot of interest from, from a lot of our government customers. We're currently in an RSTRAT certification right now. And I'll be honest with you, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a difficult and arduous process. Um, but the, uh, the, the end customer requires the, the ability to utilize all of the spectral assets or constellation assets available to them. And WGS is one of them. So um, uh, the end goal for any terminal that we develop uh, that is in the KA spectrum, the, uh, the government intends or wants to see it in a, a WGS certification uh, capability so they can operate on any spectrum. Um, so from, from, a, from a qualification standpoint and independent lab qualifications, we, you know, we, we take those things very seriously at GetSat and we have seen from the government customer that they require it um, to this point. Um, there is, I think, in the future, there will, will be some leniency on uh, 810 and, and 461 as we move forward with different uh, antenna technologies and different uh, constellation usages. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I see it as most requirements are going to maintain um, and stay uh, in place. And I, I, don't, I don't see a large portion uh, of the government customers relaxing those standards um, uh, when in in the near future from a get test standpoint. We just don't see it. Mm -hmm. I hope everyone was taking notes because if you needed the list of standards that matter for terminals, Jason, just put them all out there. So no questions about what they are. They're there. Go go rewind the video. Um, but Matt, STCs, I think, are, are another standard and kind of what everyone thinks about when they think about the aero market. Um, but 
who do they matter to? Why do they matter? Kind of walk us through that process. So air, airborne uh, is evidenced by uh, some of the recent events uh, that we've seen is, is a pretty um, safety focused market. And so you have a huge number of safety requirements uh, that are levied uh, for testing the equipment and ensuring that you won't impact airport aircraft performance. Everything from not interfering with the avionics in the, in the cockpit to ensuring that a bird hitting the antenna won't in, impact uh, safety on any other portion of the aircraft, won't break anything off, anything like that. So uh, the terminals have to deal with all of those and, and you deal with them at, at different levels, right? There are um, installations that what can do as a field approval uh, which is different than an STC where you're actually extending the certification of the aircraft to include this new piece of equipment. So that's why it's called a supplemental type certificate. Um, and then even achieving that, uh, if you are going to be line fit with one of the uh, equipment manufacturers like Boeing Airbus, now you have to uh, go another level of, of them who, they who are ensuring that their suppliers in the equipment meet additional reliability requirements because obviously when they sell an aircraft, they don't want to have to service it because of something that you put on the aircraft. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not just the big boy uh, in terms of the, the wide bodies, but that's true of all the business market as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that seems to be. Not only do we have, you know, all of those safety requirements that a basic design has to do, but then we turn around and look at the RF requirements, the performance requirements required to make a link. Mm -hmm. So we we look upon it really as, you know, you, you can try and take your technology and figure out, uh, you know, try and try and see the world from that view of that technology, or you can say, here are the requirements, right, that the customer has, that the airframe has, that the the FAA has. How do we make the best? A solution that meets all of those requirements. So it, it really, it, it, uh, I, I think, you know, we've talked about flexibility and a focus on the customer. Again, it's what are they looking for and how do we solve that solution as opposed to here's my product, it must solve your solution because that's the product I have. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so we've got about 15 more minutes, a uh, bunch of questions. So if you folks are listening behind at home or in the office, maybe even, um, Continue to ask your questions. Um, if you ask them in the chat, they won't show up. There's actually a dedicated Q&A button, so use that. Um, but I wanted to move to a question from Kirk to kind of transition into our last block of topics, which are game changers. Uh, Will, we'll, we'll start with you and we'll ask this question. Do you see any operators, service providers working to offer an integrated service to end users that leverage more than one orbit constellation in the same service package? Could it could integrated offerings for different waveforms, ground networks, et cetera? So yes, that, that is absolutely an offering. It's an offering today. Uh, it just depends on what you want to integrate, right? Whether it's a, a microwave uh, radio or an LTE connection to a geo, uh, a MEO, and as LEOs come online, they're going to be integrated as part of that, that ecosystem, right? Part of that paradigm. All of those will be tied together and I like Brad's software word earlier. I think you made up a new software, softwareism or something like that word. Softwareification. Softwareification. All of it will be softwareification together into basically a seamless experience for you. So yes, is the answer. Yeah, uh, I guess the follow-up to that is why. why. Why are you going through all this headache? Because it's not easy. No, no, it's, it's very complicated, uh, but it provides a better experience at the end of the day, right? Mm -hmm. If we can get uh, somebody on an LTE link it's a lower latency, right? It's a lower cost in some cases than, than the satellite backhaul. But then if it goes down, how do you make sure you can uh, provide that comms if you, if you go out of a coverage area, for example, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of reasons to do it. Most of them depend on what the customer is looking for. But a lot of it's about providing the best service you can at the lowest price you can. Matt? I think the easiest, easiest answer to that question is just look at coverage and worldwide coverage. Um, you know, technology has changed from a, a geo satellite where you have one beam covering a continent to HTS where I have multiple beams to increase the, uh, the performance to now we're going to go dynamic, right? So all of those beams aren't going to be fixed. They're going to be moving, uh, going along with the softwareification of, of these networks. Um, but when you have existing assets that cover certain areas, right, either the U.S., for example, I might have one beam on the U.S. or HTS satellites with lots of beams, um, the, the geo satellites don't work very well at polar, right? So you have customers who require operation in the polar, and that's an excellent example of where you might want to have a geo Leo or a geo Mio uh, common 
uh, performing uh, antenna system, a terminal that can support both. And, uh, and it, it's very clear that, uh, that that's where things are going. And again, you know, I mentioned uh, the airframers themselves are looking for equipment. I want to put equipment on that'll work with all of these different networks. Um, so it, it becomes incumbent on us as equipment and terminal providers to provide that kind of solution. What? So there, there is a, a, a missing a, lot, a missing point into all of this is the fact that the, you go from geo could be C band KU or KA to a MIO that is particularly KA. And then if you want to move to Leo, you have to have KU and KA. So you cannot put on an airline five different antennas as you cannot put in a yad multiple different systems as well, or a, or a cruise line. And that is where the adaptability of multi-band, multi-orbit, multi-service, it is key for the short future. Mm -hmm. And something that I do know the team that is with us today, they're all looking at it as well. We are putting a lot of effort to it and it requires a massive investment as an R&D investment in able to get there. And that is the, will be the differentiator in the short path because OneWeb, it is active. It's going to start providing services quite soon, at least for the polar regions. And it will open the door for something that has been unserved. Areas northern of Alaska where having a satellite, a good internet connection has been almost impossible. Same to the, uh, to the Artant, Art Arctica region in the South Pole. It has never been served properly. They have been using microwave, et cetera. Now they have the option to have an actual satellite connection established and maintained it a long time. That will be the diversity and the flexibility to have a terminal able to join multiple orbits, multiple bands will be critical. Mm -hmm. Jason, I wanna, I wanna bring you in on the conversation and add, add another question in dynamic. Um, the question is, what developments are you seeing that are moving the SATCOM world closer to the mobile phone model where you can kind of just roam seamlessly? Uh, will there be an alternative for global roaming to select a LEO provider and being vendor locked to the service? So. Well, with the population of, of LEO satellites, whether it be a, a Starlink, WorldWeb, or, or Telesat, the, the ability to go smaller, lighter, faster is going to continue to improve. Now, um, the LEO satellites are going to be be there, uh, terminal development and technology, I think will lag slightly behind uh, giving that ability. Um, there will have to be some, if, if, if we want to get to say a 12 inch by 12 inch antenna that is gonna be able to roam the world on a LEO satellite, um, you know, some of the service providers are gonna have to relax their standards or requirements for terminal certifications in their networks. Um, the only way for us to be uh, competitive or to be able to solve the problem uh, that the question poses uh, is to be uh, able to relax standards with the current technology. I mean, if your if your requirement for a a, a Leo constellation to certify is an 11G or a T or a 45 or 46 EIRP, that's a rather large antenna using current technology. Uh, you're talking about a you know 22 inch by 22 inch minimum uh, size antenna. Um, and then, you know, when you're starting to get roll off at lower look angles, um, you know, you, you take a little bit of, of a hit there. Um, I, I will say that, do I think we can get there? Yes, I think we can. Is it going to take some working together between all the, the customer requirements, uh, the service providers and terminal developers? Uh, yes, it's going to require that. And it's going to re require some relaxation of standards to get there in the next few years. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, well, I want to ask you, Maybe a, I don't know. It's like a, con a kind of controversial um, question here from Milo. <laughs> give me the hard one. All right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, you're 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 right there. I'm gonna I'm gonna pick on you a bit, but I think you're gonna ha you're gonna be the best one to answer this. Um, and, and Milo's question is about standardization of waveforms. We talk about the antenna spec, um, but his question is like, there's nothing like 5G or Ethernet satcoms in the satcom sector. What do you think is holding back some sort of standard waveform or some kind of standardization in like DBBS? And so, so Milo's spot on, right? The DBBS 2X on the outbound is standardized and that's pretty universal across it. It's the return path that we, we all try to do our own thing with much, much different than what we see. Now, the new stuff that's coming out, there are a few that are coming out that use an LTE style waveform, which obviously can generate into the 5G uh, as it evolves over that. Problem is, is our customer base. Our customers tend to expect the CIR dedicated service, right? With the amount of money they pay for the service, they want to know that that bandwidth is available to them. 
When you buy a cell service, you don't get that, right? Your cell phone shares the bandwidth with every other cell user on that particular tower. When you switch over to those waveforms, it's a shared service on the return of the satellite the same way. So you're not guaranteed that, that level of service that most people want. So if you're an energy customer and you need to be able to get your corporate data across at a particular availability, that's really not good for you to be able to use a standard shared waveform. So a lot of it's about being able to build a dedicated system where you can guarantee a certain amount of service, whereas 5G and LTE isn't. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, what about some of the waveform conversations around, hey, I can optimize this and I can get, you know, better mod cause or better, you know, spectral efficiency or whatever. How do you think that plays in? Because they always, they always like to say, hey, this is our secret sauce. This is how we innovate. No, it's true, right? There, there is a lot of innovation that goes along with that on how you choose to manage that return channel and path. And choosing the one that gives you the most efficiency helps you reduce the cost. But if you increase the complexity too much, uh, you also can drive cost in that way. So there is a bit of a balance between them. But that's, that's the innovation path for the modem technologies, right? It is driving and improving that efficiency to meet the requirements of the particular industry. And like I said, there are cases where satellite modems are going to come out that have a shared waveform, and we'll see how that's adopted and taken into the market. Mm -hmm. Matt? What do you want to add? I was just going to add that, uh, I mean, the waveforms may may start to migrate uh, to, to some commonality, but the, there's a, a whole other layer of network management uh, that runs on top of that. And that's just complicated by this transition to dynamic beams where now you're moving, uh, moving your capacity around geographically. And then you add LEO on top of that, where now whether, you, whether or not and how you manage inter-satellite links uh, plus the dynamic uh, not only um, dynamic to the customer where you're putting putting your bandwidth, but also dynamic to where you're grounding the, the data on the other end. Um, and those are very, uh, remain very proprietary for the different modem and, and network manufacturers and operators. So um, that, and, and those are driven, some of that is driven technically and some of it is driven by just the innovation that's being done by the different manufacturers. Mm -hmm. Cool. So we've got about five minutes left. Um, we have some questions that we'll have some homework to do to answer. Um, you guys can can read the questions, but I, I want to try to cover cover a couple of them and, and maybe our closing thought here. Um, one is the price to manufacture Leo terminals. I mean, that total cost of ownership, that that price point, it's going to be really sensitive to unlocking more than just high end enterprise markets, and that kind of feeds right into disruptive players like Starlink. So maybe Vlad, we'll start with you. How do you think about terminal price points, new players, disruption, kind of closing thoughts? So the terminal price point, is going to be driven by the demand that you're able to create across, which is the basic functionality of economy of scale. But there is a key element where working with partners like Mission Microwave, where you have to create the ability of reduced cost of complex components. Unfortunately, and everybody knows it here, the moment that you go multi and, uh, and diverse, the cost of transmit and buck increases exponentially. And that is where there has to be a breaking point for the components that they are expensive in the antennas. If we got into the parabolic, unfortunately, one of the most expensive one is the transmit part. If you got into the ESA approach, it is the layering panels that you use to be able to create the ASAs. So, how is gonna break that? Starlink is providing an example. They're subsidizing a massive piece of the cost of their terminal to make it affordable. And we saw that in the 90s when cell phones were getting produced. That was, it was an elite terminal. It became a mass the moment that the cost of some of the components, the antennas and the batteries went down. And we have to work toward that. It's not an easy answer because we do see our efficiencies in creating the metal components and the software and some of the elements created it in-house, we can reduce the price by massive production and sharing environments across multiple platforms. But then you hit the roadblock of the transmit part. Mm -hmm. And that is where we continue to work with, with companies like Mission Microwave and others, trying to reduce that cost where it makes their solution more affordable to the market and then it becomes affordable to the end user. Mm -hmm. And Jason, how do you kind of view, you know, price points and, and disruptive players? Well, I, I I agree that Starlink is is a disruptor. Um, they they are they are attacking the market, the terminal market, and they are subsidizing uh, the terminal development with you know the ultimate 
ultimately with uh, service uh, revenue. Um, I, I will say that uh, I think there are there are customers out there that uh, you know will will a, a KU ESA be able to operate on every Leo uh, and Geo architecture? Uh, will a KA ESA be able to operate on a Geo uh, HTS and uh, a Mio and a Leo architecture in, in, in a single terminal? So, so there's a value proposition that goes along uh, with uh, the economy uh, or the price that you're going to pay for those terminals. If you want a terminal that is just going to operate on, say, Starlink or OneWeb, um, and it just has a single modem integrated, um, I, I think a you know a thousand or fifteen hundred dollar terminal in the next three or four years is highly improbable. Um, but I think uh, with chip development and uh, the testing of, of multiple ESA technologies, uh, ultimately with for a commercial requirement, um, we could potentially get there. But in the in the market that I work in, um, there's no single point of failure. Um, there is a requirement for spectral uh, diversity. Uh, each uh, customer needs resilience. Uh, and uh, they want a terminal that's going to operate. If they, they buy a terminal, they want that terminal to operate over multiple architecture, whether it be a geo architecture, a, a Mio or a Leo architecture, and over multiple providers. Um, and I, I, think, uh, I think we're in the infancy of the development of ESAs. I think we'll continue to grow uh, and learn uh, how to be more efficient, how to reduce our costs. Um, but a, a key factor is it in this is is uh, the material cost and the material cost to build an ESA are just very 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 expensive uh, unless you have uh, unless you're buying a billion a million two million chips right so um, it's uh, it's a it's a difficult proposition to be able to get that price down to something that is commercially viable for uh, the average person you know wanting to use a, a terminal at their house. Uh, unless it is a subsidizer provided with a service uh, mm -hmm. provider. Um, but I, I think over the next three to five years, we'll, we'll start to see that. And uh, I don't know if a hundred dollar terminal is feasible, but I, I definitely think from a commercial aspect, I think a, a 2,500 to $3,000 terminal is very viable. Mm -hmm. Cool. Matt, how do you see disruption price points kind of look into the crystal ball over the next 12 to 18 months? I think um, there's a, a lot of innovation going on. There's there's uh, clearly a lot of leveraging of what's going on in cellular and 5, 5G uh, that is bringing down chipset prices for ESAs. Um, and, and one of our partners uh, working with Ball Aerospace is, is, is an example of someone who's really bringing down that, the, the potential price point. For the airline market or the aero market, right? There are the costs of installation, integration, uh, uh, all of the certification, all of those things sort of set a base level of the, of the price. So even if the terminal could be available for hundred bucks, putting it on airplane, it's not gonna be hundred bucks. But um, so if the, the price levels are coming down, I, I think it's definitely possible today uh, to put, it, put an ESA on an airplane for roughly the same cost as an electrical mechanical system. Um, and, and that I think is, is kind of where we've gone with our universal ESA. Uh, chassis to see can can we do this and and we think we can get there. Um, technology is going to improve. There are uh, you know things at the R and D level. Uh, there are things that are being invested in that that uh, that definitely have promised to reduce significantly the pricing. Um, some of them uh, will will still may not be full ESA. Um, there are are uh, what I call transition technologies. Um, that, that leverage what's available today. And then there are new technologies that are coming down the road. So I, I think for, for us, what we're looking at in terms of is, is meeting the price point at least as good as what we've got now um, and improving that and providing improved per performance at that price point. And then as technology progresses, again, have, uh, have uh, uh, the flexibility to integrate those technologies as time goes on. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, closing thoughts. Um, I think just from a closing perspective, right, we're in a time of change again, right? It's like when HTS has started to come around, right? We're seeing a lot of disruptions to the market. We're seeing a lot of, of new information coming around. And as Leo's come online, I think they're going to be disruptive. And I think they're going to drive innovation, not just in software, but in terminals too. You know, we need to remember that, um, to continue to drive through that innovation and help our customers through these transitions. As I do think this is gonna be pretty game-changing for, for many of us, right? There was a question about, you know, 
will it affect your customers? Yes, it's absolutely going to affect our customers. The question is going to be how much. And I don't think any of us can really see that yet. It'll drive terminal prices down. It'll offer new solutions. It'll change the cost of geo bandwidth. But we're really in a reactive point to see how does it, how much does it happen? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. So thanks everybody for, for being here on the panel. Some really great thoughts. You know, we covered everything from standards and specifications, rewind to hear Jason's, you know, laundry list of what the standards are. Uh, Will talking about flexibility and kind of the role of service providers changing. Uh, Vlad talking about all the, the terminal updates and Matt focusing on kind of the arrow markets. Some really great conversations here. Thanks again to the folks that keep forgetting this, it's over there. Mission Microwave, um, there's a link down in the bottom. So go ahead and check out their websites. They're just doing some really cool stuff on you know, a, a really important piece of the, of the terminal picture that if you're an end user, um, it's really great to understand because that, that will drive a lot of your choices and, and selections like Bill mentioned. If you want you know, really big pipes, there's, there's only a couple of folks that can do that. Uh, thanks again for everybody for joining me. Um, good afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you are in the world. Um, I look forward to staying in touch and take care and see you in the next one.